having lessons of this type. This is our 80th song to study in our series of studies. Number 49, as Bobby has announced and sung, we've sung as the life of a flower. We've just sung it. We are about to study it, and then we will sing it again for an invitation song. Once again, we have lessons of this type uh, for a number of different reasons, one of which is I really never paid a whole lot of attention to our psalm books when growing up. I mean, you just open the book and sing. We know that we buy them, but we forget about, I think, that they just don't magically appear. It takes somebody to write the uh, words, and then it takes somebody to write the melody. And so we thank these people. We talk about them a little bit, what little we know about these individuals, and we do that to appreciate them and their work. Also, and more importantly, we have these lessons, sermon, and song to help us understand what we are singing and to concentrate on the words. As we often say, it's, it's great to have melody, but it is greater to concentrate on the actual words we are singing. Now, and it's not true in this particular song, but in some songs, there are words used that we don't use anymore, or there are words used in a very poetic sense that we may not have considered before. The point is we need to know, obviously, as we praise God and encourage each other, we need to know exactly what it is that we are singing. And so to focus more on the words that we sing, we have these lessons also. We do want to get right into our study. As in previous studies of this nature, we'll look at those who made the song, and then we'll spend more time in the latter part of the lesson talking about the song itself and what it means and an application for us. First of all, the poet, the lady who wrote the words to As the Life of a Flower, uh, Mrs. Laura Emmeline Pixley Newell. She lived from 1854 to 1916. A little bit of biographical information. We don't have a lot. We have some. She was born February the 5th, 1854 in a town called New Marlboro, New Marlboro, Massachusetts. And I'd never heard of that town before. I've heard of Boston. That's about the only town I have even acquainted with, uh, at least knowledge-wise, in the state. New Marlboro is on the opposite end of the state in the southwestern corner, nowhere near the city of Boston. In fact, it's a very small town. It's not as big as Verona uh, population-wise, so it's a very, a very small town. I guess she would be their claim to fame. I, I don't know. Anyway, she was actually orphaned at an early age. Her mother died not long after her birth, which was not uncommon in, in that time frame. A lot, of, a lot of people died in infancy and there were many mothers who died either in childbirth or not long thereafter. We don't know the particulars of her mother's birth or her dad's other than they both died when she was an infant and her aunt took her and raised her and her uncle died. Her aunt's husband, her uncle died not long after they took her into their home. And so a lot of tragedy really beginning early in life for uh, Miss Newell. The family moved to the state of Kansas. Her aunt taught school in her own home and, of course, taught uh, little Laura when she was able to be taught. She began writing poems at the age of 12. A couple of years later, those poems began appearing in local newspapers. She said it was not her idea or intention to pursue a literary career, but sometimes things just happen in life, and this sort of just fell into place for her. In 1871, she married a carpenter, and together they had six children. One of them died while young by accident. And so again, that adding to the heartache. They belonged to the Congregational Church there in town. This church actually had a nickname, the Breacher's Bible and Rifle Church. That was a new one for me. I never heard of a Bible and Rifle Church. Uh, there are all sorts of different denominations, but I, I never come across that one. Actually, a fellow, a preacher by the name of Breacher from the state of Connecticut, there were some people who left Connecticut and moved to Kansas to settle. And Breacher sent 
in crates marked Bibles on the outside, rifles on the inside of the crates to the congregation there in Kansas. These people were against slavery. And so the preacher in Connecticut supplied them with Bibles simply to protect themselves from those who uh, tried to push their views on them. And that's how this came to be known as the Breacher's Bible and Rifle Church. And the church building still stands today. Uh, and I guess that would actually be the claim to fame of the town, at least, of, of that part of Kansas. Uh, I'm sure modifications were made through the years, but this is the basic structure, I'm told. It was added to the historical uh, place, the historical sites list there in Kansas back in 1971, I think. Again, a few modifications. They would not have had the electric lines, obviously, in the 1800s, but this is where uh, she would have attended, and that is the Breacher's Bible and Rifle Church. In 1873, Miss Newell was listening to somebody bemoaning the fact that there were so few hymns being written, and so Miss Newell said, I'm going to do something about that. And she started with her poetry, she started writing songs. Some were sacred, some were secular, and her works some estimate to be numbering in the thousands. She was so prolific, she was eventually, eventually nicknamed the Sweet Singer of Kansas. And so she was, uh, had some renown, obviously. Her best known hymn, though, and the only one credited to her in our hymn books is this one, As the Life of a Flower. It was produced in 1900. And four. She would pass away in Manhattan, Kansas, October 13th, 1916. We thank then Miss Newell for giving us a beautiful poem to sing. Now, the musician George Henry Ramsey know practically nothing about him. I don't have a picture to show you, I don't have his exact birth or death date. He was born in 1858 died in 1915, and this all took place in Texas, and that's about all we know about George Henry Ramsey. He wrote the melody to accompany the poem that Miss Newell wrote. Now, I, I want to make this observation, and this is just my personal observation. It has nothing to do with anything about salvation. But to me, the melody does not go with the song. Uh, it's a beautiful song. I, I love the song. It's a beautiful tune. But to me, the tune doesn't go with the words. When you stop and look carefully at the words, the tune is upbeat and lively. This is a very somber song. It talks a whole lot about how brief life is and the fact that we are going to die. I would have thought, had I wrote the melody, I would have chosen one a bit slower and a bit more somber. If you watch horror movies, you know they don't use lively, upbeat music to accompany horror movies. It just spoils the scene if you do that. They choose the music carefully to fit the movie. Now, a movie that's uh, a comedy or along that line, you're going to have the upbeat um, music to accompany that. So you might expect a more somber tune to go with the words, but I guess if you look at this from another standpoint, if you're a Christian and prepared for death and for judgment, then I guess there could be some liveliness and an upbeat view to that because we are ready. So maybe the tune does go with the song. But that's just my, my conjecture, my opinion on that. The overall thrust of the song, it encourages us to remember that life is brief and we want to use our opportunities wisely as we get ready for the next life. Enough of that. Thank these two for the words and the melody, and now the song itself as the life of a flower. Stanza number one says that life is a lot like a flower. Personally, I don't know much about flowers. I'm not much of a flower person. Some of you are. My mother, when she was able, she loved to, to plant and to raise flowers. I, I remember one year, unknown to me, she planted some in the yard, and I got the mower and mowed every one of them down. I thought they were weeds. And I learned real quick to ask before mowing the next time. When Tanya and I married, I told her when it came to yard work, 
I'll mow the yard and I'll do the weeding, eating. If you want any flowers, that's up to you. I don't have time for that. You know, as husbands, sometimes you have to lay the law down. And it didn't stay laid down very long, though, because we planted rose bushes and we planted laurel pedlums and we planted azaleas and so forth, and we trimmed those. We, we, not her, but we trimmed those things. So I'm really not much on flowers. They're pretty. I know that. Most of them have a good smell. But also know that they don't last very long. We have buttercups that come up in the spring, as I guess many of you do, and they're really great to look at for a very brief time. And then they die. And you cannot mow those things down the moment they die. You've got to let them wait and wait and wait until they wither and look awful. I'm told they won't come back next year if you go ahead and mow them down right when they die. So I just don't see the... I'll just change the subject. I'm not much on flowers. I'm glad some of you are. I'm glad William and Linda uh, do a great job of beautifying the pulpit area. Now these flowers, for whatever reason, just keep on lasting. You don't have to water them or anything. They just last and last and last. But for the purpose of this lesson, I don't know that, I don't know that Miss Newell knew anything about artificial flowers. So she compares life to a flower. And so stanza one says that our lives are like a flower in terms of brevity. In other words, as the life of a flower, so is our life. She says, as a breath or a sigh. How long does it take to take a breath? Second. How long does it take to sigh? A second doesn't take long to do that. She goes on to say that life is like that. It's brief. So the years that we live as a dream hasten by. How long does it take to dream? Those who are supposed experts tell us that our longest dreams in the night last only about 10 seconds. How they know that, don't ask me. <laughs> They've never got in my head. Uh, I think I've dreamt all night sometimes. Well, they tell us, I guess from sleep studies or whatever, that your longest dream actually just lasts about 10 seconds. Well, I don't know, but I do know that unless you write your dreams down uh, when you get up in the morning, you'll soon forget them, and so that may be, have meaning here as well. They're, they're brief. The songwriter is saying that life is brief, how quickly life is passing. I don't know that we appreciated that when we were young. We couldn't wait till Christmas came around. We couldn't wait till summer vacation, school was out. But the older we get, we all know that life is really, really hastening by, as Miss Newell says in our song. Now, we know there are a number of verses in the Bible that speak again of how short life is. Job said, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle. We might liken that to a sewing needle on a sewing machine. I, my mom sewed when, when uh, she was able, and I often watched her sewing. And that needle would go it up and down so fast. That might be an imagery that we could use. We may not be familiar with a weaver's shuttle, but we know about sewing machines, how swiftly life is going by, the days are going by. Moses spoke of the brevity of life, and this could be where Miss Newell drew her imagery for the song. In the morning they are like grass which grows up, in the morning it flourishes and grows up, but you cut it down, and it doesn't take long for the grass to wither. Our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a story that is told. The days of our years are 70, three score years and 10. If we happen to live to be four score or 80, yet is there strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off. Brief. It is soon cut off and we fly away. James says our life is like a vapor. We go out on these beautiful, crisp fall mornings and breathe the warm air into the cold. There's a mist there, but it's just there briefly, and then it's gone. James says life is a lot like that. Peter says we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The point Peter's making in this passage is he is contrasting the word of God, which lives and remains forever with life on earth. He says, all flesh does not live and abide forever. Flesh is a lot like grass. 
in all the glory of man as the flower of grass. She could have used this passage to make her point. The grass withers, the flower falls away. That's life, that's us, that's me and you. But the word of the Lord endures forever. In contrast to us, it is forever. And therefore, I want to be building my life primarily then on the word of God. All the things we get all worked up about in this life don't amount to anything in the long run. They're temporary. Build your life on the word of God is Peter's point. But of course, our point from this verse is just reemphasizing that life is very brief as the life of a flower. As a breath or a sigh, true today we are here, but tomorrow may see. Well, we do have today. I don't know what the rest of the day holds in store. None of us do, but we do know we have right now. The Hebrew writer says, exhort one another daily while it is called today, today, today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. You have today. Encourage each other today, lest you become hardened today. Because sin is so deceitful. Use the day for the glory of God. And so, tomorrow may see. We've got today, but tomorrow, who knows, it might see. For us, just a grave in the veil and the memory of me. Now, the word veil is just a shortened form of valley. Veil and valley are the same thing. It means the same thing. So the sobering thought is, we're here today, tomorrow we may be in the grave, is the idea. That is, we may die, and then this is uh, uh, brief, and after our death, there is judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, is appointed that a man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. That could very well happen today, for that matter, tomorrow. But whenever it happens, it's going to be brief in the long run. All that's going to be left on this earth of us, besides our remains, is a memory. Our soul, of course, will be in safekeeping of God, but as far as this earth, all that will be left of us is a memory, and not a long memory at that. You think about it. Now, when we die, our immediate family will remember us as long as they live. And then, if you're blessed with grandchildren, those grandchildren will remember you not as well as did your children. And then odds are their children, this all depends, odds are their children probably won't even know who you were. Do you know your great-grandparents? Do you know who your great-grandparents were? Some of you may. I have a vague, a very vague Remembrance of one of my great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers. All the others had passed away. And so all that will be left of us when we die will be a memory. And it's not going to be a long-lived memory at that. Now, there will be digital images, I'm sure, of us. Just like we may have pictures of those of our ancestors that have gone before and things of that nature. But just a memory. Now, the question is, how will we be remembered? Life is brief. Are we living a life that will be remembered at least in a good way by those who love us? And in large part, we're determining what the memory is now as we're living by the lives that we live. And hopefully, we can be remembered as being faithful children of God by those who knew us. I want to diverge here just briefly and look at the life of King Jehoram and this chilling indictment the Bible gives of his life. Jehoram was 32 years old when he was, was he when he began to rule or reign. He reigned in Jerusalem eight years and the part of it is he died without being desired. Another way of translating that is he died with no one's regret. No one was sorry the man died. No one was sorry that he was gone. All that's left on the earth is just a memory. They didn't have many memories of King Jehoram. That's really a sad way. A sad way to spend a life and a sad way to exit a life. 
You contrast Jehoram with people that we've known in our lives, Christians, dads and moms, maybe grandparents, others who've influenced us, Bible class teachers, uh, acquaintances and so forth, who set the example and they've gone on to their reward, but we would not be who we are were it not for their influence on us. Well, we have generations coming up that likewise need good influences, good Christian influences and impact and therefore, we want to make sure that we're so living that we leave behind a good memory and a good influence on the lives of others. And so, how will we be remembered? The next stanza of the song sort of addresses that question. As the life of a flower be our lives pure and sweet. Now, this stanza says that our lives are like a flower in terms of influence. You may ask, well, does a flower have influence? Well, it, it does in a sense. Flowers are bright. They are beautiful. They certainly can brighten up a room. And that's what we ought to be doing with our lives. Our lives should be pure and sweet and bright in the way for the friends that we greet. We want to attract others to our lifestyle. We don't want to be a turnoff. We don't want to repel others. We don't want to see people turning and going the other way whenever we come up to meet them. That's indicative of perhaps a problem on our part. And so we can brighten the way for others as we strive to be the light of the world. Jesus says, and we know these verses, but again, these verses speak of the pure and sweet, brightening impact we have on the lives of others. You are the light of the world. City set on a hill cannot be hid. You don't light a candle and hide it. You put it on the candlestick and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Let your influence be felt. Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is then in heaven. And so, the next uh, sweet incense arise from our hearts as we live. Again, the, the metaphor of sweet incense may be the fragrance, fragrance of the flower. As we live close to him who doth teach us to love and forgive. Our actions, in a sense, can be a sweet-smelling aroma to others. Sometimes we mess up or we do something bad and we say, you know, that stinks. There may not be an odor there, but it's repulsive to us. Well, you can use that in a good sense also, and Paul does in Philippians 4. He said, I have received of Epaphroditus things you sent. You made a sacrifice to support me. He's encouraging the Philippians. He says that sacrifice was an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, pleasing then to God. And so we impact others as we live for Christ. We can be, our lives are like a flower from the standpoint of brevity, but our lives also can be like a flower from the standpoint of the influence we are to have upon others. Now, the third stanza, while we tarry below, that is, in this life right now, we're, what we're doing right now is tarrying below. While we tarry below, here's what we need to be doing. Let us trust and adore him who leads us each day toward the radiant shore. This stanza tells us our lives are like a flower, in terms of being prepared for what you might call God's garden above, and that, of course, being heaven. Toward the radiant shore, again, the shore of heaven is the figure. There in heaven, God's garden above, the sun never sets. There the flowers never fade. In contrast to this life, where the sun does set, days do come to an end, flowers cut do fade. No sorrow or death may its borders invade. Think of the imagery. Think of some Bible verses. John speaking of his vision of heaven. The city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it. No sun set, no moon rise in heaven. Because the glory of God is the light of it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. The sun doesn't set in that image there of heaven, just as the song says. 
Again, Revelation 22 speaks of the pure river of water of life coming out of the throne of God of the Lamb. Speaks of the tree of life bearing 12, 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. Fruit doesn't fade. Flowers don't fade is the idea in heaven. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Again, just uh, picturesque, vivid imagery of the joy and the beauty and the eternal life in heaven. And then Revelation 21, 4, uh, no death invades, no sorrow invades. The songwriter said, heaven, well, that's what this verse says. God wipes away all tears from their eyes. No more death, no sorrow, no crying, no pain, for those things were in this life. Now we have tears and death and sorrow, crying and pain. But then, as the songwriter says, we're not going to have those things. And so this all reminds us then that the goal of this life should be heaven. The goal of this life is heaven. If I'm not prepared for heaven, I have this opportunity to be baptized into Jesus. And that, of course, having put my faith in Jesus and repenting, confessing, I could be baptized and be a child of God today before we leave. If as a child of God, I have grown weary in my walk with the Lord, I've stumbled into sin, I can have people pray for me and be forgiven. Or I might just need encouraging prayer. But certainly, this life is all about getting ready for heaven. Now the chorus, just a reminder again of the brevity of life. As the life of a flower as a breath or a sigh, those things are short, very short. So the years are short. They glide away. They pass away. Where did the time go? We often say it's gone. They glide away. And alas, we must die. We must die. Death is a fact of life that we don't need to keep at a safe distance. And again, when we zero in on the words of this song, they might strike one initially as being odd, if not morbid. Our lives are brief, and let's face it, we're going to die. Why would Miss Newell pen these words? Well, again, we need to go back to the 19th century. Back in those days, most people died at home, and the body was often kept in the home and the funeral many times took place in the home now most in our culture do not die at home 80 percent of people surveyed said they wanted to die at home but only about 20 percent of people in our country die at home most want to die at home but most don't die at home both of my grandmothers died at home they were the exception to the rule. But again, when she penned the words of this song, most everybody died at home. You were used to seeing dead bodies. You were used to seeing death in your home. Certainly older people did, but even younger people, they were accustomed to seeing death in the home. They were very familiar with it. Infant mortality rates were very high then. And obviously child and, and adults disease, work-related accidents were very, very common, and she lived in Kansas. This was frontier life then, very difficult life. Death was a, a, a daily part of life in, in that time. Now, our culture today, well, we want to keep death at a distance. Let people die in the uh, at, at the hospital, and let's handle the body in a funeral home. That's the way our culture wants to handle things, that is, keep death at a distance. Well, we need to remember, keep it at a distance or not, we might as well face that we're going to die. We are mortal people, and so it behooves us then to be getting ready for that, be getting ready for that, not, not just living every day in dread, but simply living every day getting ready for our death and then, and then judgment. Beautiful song, I think, as the life of a flower is a beautiful song. It is a, a somber song, though, also, and a very thought-provoking song. And it, as we sing it, ought to cause us to hit the pause button of life and contemplate 
the value of life. Somebody said life is a lot like a coin. You can spend it any way you want to, but you can only spend it once. And once it's spent, it's gone, and you can't get it back. So our time here is given us to God as preparation for eternity. We want to make the most of every opportunity, the most of every opportunity. We don't know when the Lord's coming back, and we don't know when we're going to leave this earth in death. We simply always need to be ready, and remember that our earthly existence is a lot like the life of a flower. Let us stand. Let us sing.